Hello, I'm Harald Sack. And I'm Sasha Bruns. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number two, Knowledge Representation with Graphs. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about vocabularies and model building with RDFS. Okay, first of all, let's recap. You remember our graph here, we have Spock, he has the origin planet Vulcan. But what does this really mean? What do we see here? So the only thing that we see here is of course that something which can uniquely identified via a URI that we have given here, which refers to Spock, is connected to another URI, which is uniquely identified again by a URI for planet Vulcan. However, what I can do is of course I can use completely different URIs to denote exactly the same thing, because the first one in blue they refer to DBpedia, the second one they refer to Wikidata, but in both of these knowledge bases there is a resource called Spock and, in th and on the other hand also a resource called Planet Vulcan. The point is if you really want to know what that means, besides you know you have here an, a node connected via a property to another node that are associated with some URI where, where we have no idea what it means, we need some means to, to express more semantics. So we need more semantic expressivity. This means we are now here in the Semantic Web Technology stack on the next level where we are building models. And here we are going to talk about RDF schema. But first, let's go for some definitions. Yes. So let's start with the definition of a term. A term is a word, compound word or multi-word expression that in specific context is given specific meanings. Also, we have a terminology or a vocabulary. Vocabulary is basically a set of terms that are used to describe data in a particular domain or even set of domains. We also have a schema. Schema is a formal description of the high-level structure of a data set that may be used for a variety of purposes like reasoning, validating, querying, indexing over one set of data. And we also differentiate a semantic schema. Semantic schema is a schema that allows for defining the meaning of high-level terms like vocabulary or terminology, which facilitates reasoning over graphs using those terms. Okay, now let's get a bit more specific. For defining schemas, what we need are things to aggregate stuff. And the first aggregator we get to know is classes. So what are classes? Classes, we all know. Classes are abstract groups, sets or collections of things, of resources. And usually those resources, they have the same kind of conceptual similarities. So they share a specific property, for example. Class group resources, so the things which are uh, classes uh, consist of, are so-called instances here and they are of the same type. Classes are characterized by attributes, you know that, and you see here down there, for example, in the yellow box, this is a kind of semi-formal description of a class, and there we define person, and we say a person has a first name, which usually is given as a string, has a family name also given as a string, and a birth date, which is given as a date, and so on and so on. But of course, I could also denote a class with an RDF graph that you see here on the other side here, we have an, F, uh, an RDF graph again for a person. Um, we also, as it's mentioned, the classes and the instances, they are related to each other via properties. So we also have an RDF property, which is defined as a relation between subject resources, instances or classes, and object resources, also, um, also instances, classes, or even literals. Instances are individual members of a class and, of course, instance can be a member of multiple classes. Let's take a look at the graph. Here we can see Leonard Nimoy is a, um, it is an instance, yes, so because it's somebody very concrete. And we are, via property, we define that uh, Leonard Nimoy, the instant, it belongs to a class person. And, of course, as we have seen in the previous slide, person can be associated with a um, many attributes like names, birthplace, and so on. But it's not necessarily mean that Leonard Nimoy can be only a person. He can also be um, of class actor, for example. And we go further with RDFS schema. Okay, now to express exactly this schema definition that we have seen on the pages before, 
in RDF, we are going to need the RDF schema language, officially called RDF vocabulary description language. RDF schema allows the definition of classes via so-called RDFS class. RDFS class is the class of all the classes. And if I want to create a class uh, or to say that some element is a member of a class, I'm using RDF type. RDF type here is equivalent to class instantiation in, in the sense of this is instant is member of a specific class. Then I use RDF type. You see this for example here in our examples we say person is of type RDFS class, so a person is a class, and we say then the specific instance, Leonard Nimoy, is of type person, so Leonard Nimoy, RDF type person. This means that Leonard Nimoy is element of the class person. Straightforward, you can define here your first schemas and you can say that specific instances are populating that kind of a schema. The same also holds for the properties. In RDFS, all properties are defined as instances of a class, RDF property, the class of all properties. And we also, in RDFS, we can also provide some kind of restrictions on domain and range via RDFS domain and RDFS range. Let's take a look at the example. So we say that a person is of type class, so a person is a class, and occupation is also a class. Then we define a property profession that is of type RDF property. And then we use these kind of special properties RDFS domain and RDFS range. What does it mean? If I say, if I define property profession and its domain as a person, it means that the subject of a property profession will, will always belong to a class person. And the same holds for range. If if I say that profession has occupation in range, it means that the object uh, of, the, of the property profession will be of class occupation. But let's take a look at the formal definition of um, RDFS domain and RDFS range. Um, let's say that capital A and capital B are classes. Capital P is a property and AB are instances, are some instances, some individuals. Then it holds that for all A, B, for all instances A, B, and for, uh, for classes A capital and B capital, and also for a property P capital, um, if, um, if it holds that if there is um, A, B, so instances A, B that are related via P, and P has capital A or class A in the domain, and also P has a B, capital B, in a range, it means that A is of type A capital and B is of type B capital. So this uh, provides us with a possibility to define additional class inst instantiation. So it means that even if before uh, beforehand A was not necessarily explicitly defined as of ty a type A, it will provide additional class uh, definition for, for an instance. Okay. And in RDFS, everything what you model is called a resource. So therefore, there is also um, a keyword which is called RDFS resource. And all of the things like a class or property that you see here, which are uh, the keywords for meta class and meta properties, or what is an RDFS literal, XML literal, or RDFS data type, these are all resources I can talk about. So these things are of type resource. And they are by definition classes. So RDFS class is the class of all properties. RDF property, so watch out, this is not RDFS property, this is no typo, this is RDF property. On a purpose not to be mistaken then with a RDFS property that you will later see that is then also, no that's RDF predicate, RDFS predicate. Don't want to confuse you too much, but you will see then for verification that there is a reason why they have chosen this RDF property in that way. However, you have to take care to not to use RDFS property here. Going further, RDFS literal is the class of all literals and RDFS XML literal is the class of all XML schema data type properties, uh, data type literals, of course. And then you have also RDFS data type, which denotes a simple data type. 
You can look up the definitions for these things then in the reference. This is given uh, at the end of the slide deck if you want to uh, know exactly what this denotes and if you also want to see more examples on that. However, we will use it once in a while also then in the exercises and um, so therefore you will get used to that. Okay, let's continue. The nice thing when I'm defining schemas is of course I want to put classes with each other in relation. And they cannot only be related via specific properties that we define, there can also be a kind of hierarchical class relationship, which means I define a class which is either more general than the class I had before or more specific. So I'm defining subclasses and superclasses. And for that, I only need one property to do that. It's the, the property called RDFS subclass of. So what we are doing here is we are defining a special kind of occupation. So occupation here is the superclass and scientist here would be a special kind of occupation. So we define here scientist is a subclass of occupation. So you here you see it the, uh, written down in uh, the set theoretic language. And here you see how you, we would write this in RDF schema. So scientist, RDF is subclass of occupation. That means that a scientist is a subclass of uh, occupation. And of course, there can be instances of scientists like a scientific assistant, a science officer, and so on. So they are then inside the scope of that class. But of course, you see, if something is already in the class scientist, at the same time, it always holds that it will be also of the, uh, part or member of the superclass. It will also be then an occupation. So this is the nice thing when we are defining class hierarchies. So if I want to define the semantics of that, so the semantics of RDFS subclass of, then for all A, B, capital A, capital B classes and A an instance, it holds that if A, capital A, is a subclass of capital B, then exactly if the, uh, A is element of capital A, then it holds or this implies that A is also element of B. It means uh, if we go down then to, to RDF, if we have A, capital A and capital T, if we have the triple A is of RDF type, type capital A and we have the triple that A is uh, of RDFS subclass of B, then of course it also holds or it is implied that we have a new triple A is also then of type capital B. So this is a kind of let's say um, deduction that you can always make and that's the semantics that is part of RDF subclass which is encoded in exactly this fragment of the RDF schema language. The same holds for properties. Yes, properties are can also be related to each other via hierarchical relationships. So basically we can define that um, one property is a more specific property of another one via RDFS subproperty of. For example, here in example you see the triple that the first name is RDFS subproperty of the property name. It means that first name is a kind of name but a bit more specific. Let's take a look at the formal definition as well. So let's say that A, B are property, a, a and B capital are properties and A, B are instances. It means that A capital is a subproperty of B capital if and only if for a, if A, B are related via A capital, it also holds that A, B are related via B capital. That means that for all instances A and B and properties um, A capital and B capital, if um, A and B are related via A and A capital is a subproperty of G B capital, it also holds that A uh, and B are related via B capital. And this is not all. So there are more properties and parts of RDF schema language. For example, the RDFS annotation properties. And their purpose is to annotate resources with useful, which means human readable information. So they have no, let's say, fixed or uh, formal semantics as we have seen for RDFS subclass and RDFS subproperty. First of all, we have RDFSC also. So this is nothing else but to define a relation of a resource to another one which explains it. So if you want to explain something, you say, yeah, A 
RDFSC also B and then B contains probably some text or is something which explains A further. A bit more specific then is RDFS is defined by, so this is a sub-property of RDFSC also, and this defines a relation of a resource to its definition. So if A and B are related via is defined by, then this means B contains the definition of A. If you want to comment something, use RDFS comment and then of course follows some text string that comments in the end then um, the resource we have associated with it. And you all know it already, RDFS label. This is a readable name of a resource. So not an ID, so you don't take numbers here. Take something what you really can read. And the nice thing is, of course, you can provide it then in any kind of language for which we have these kind of language abbreviations. Considering the semantics, as you see here for RDFSC also is defined by command and label. The semantic is only given in natural language definitions. So there is no formal definition for that because they don't hold additional semantics which can be or is then explicitly also used by a reasoner, for example. So this is really for human readable information only. Yes, let's take a look at the overall RDFS schema. So we talked today uh, that RDFS schema provides us a possibility to define three types of entities. First of all, it's of course class definitions. Uh, we, tol we talked that we define uh, uh, that all classes that are defined are always of RDF type, RDFS class. So here you can see, for example, a person is an RDFS class, an occupation in RDFS class, and so on. Also, classes can um, hold hierarchical relations to other classes. Like this, we can see that artist, for example, is a subclass of occupation, and so on. The second entity that um, we talked about are the properties. All properties in RDFS are of type RDF property. Yes, property is a, is a class for all properties are there. And also properties can be defined via special relations like RDFS domain and range, which restrict the subject and object definitions of the properties. And the third entity, of course, are our instances. Yes, something very specific, something very concrete. Um, by the, uh, to, to say that one instance belongs to some specific class, we use RDF, RDF type. Like this, we can see that, for example, Leonard Nimoy is of type person. So the instance, individual instance, Leonard Nimoy, is a person. Um, instances are related to each other via, uh, via properties, um, object properties and data type properties, but this we will talk later about. And, um, also, everything what uh, uh, some all the terminology, so all the class definitions and property de definitions are co uh, is called terminological knowledge. When we talk about something con concrete, the instances we talk about assertional knowledge or a box. And let's go to the essentials. Okay. So what we have learned so far is that RDF classes and properties provide a high level vocabulary, which means that it's a set of RDF terms that are for general use in RDF descriptions. We have seen that, of course, we can define by that type of vocabularies, where we define, for example, sets of actors and hierarchies that we have there or other kind of person descriptions or whatever. So we can define really vocabularies that can easily be reused across different independent RDF resources. So if you have defined them, if they have a defined namespace, you can use it every way, everywhere you want to, to use it. Datasets that agree on vocabularies, that's clear, are better to be integrated. So they are better integrable <laughs> since they speak the same language, which was one of the prerequisites to understand each other and for successful communication as you might remember. So for data integration, it's really important that these kind of data set definitions that we have, these vocabularies, are reused. So that's quite an essential thing. And <coughs> to enable better reuse, there are some naming conventions. So this is not, let's say, a formal definition or something, but of course, it's a kind of best practice that has been used. Classes usually that you see here in RDF are usually given, if they have a concrete name, they are given in 
uppercase singular names like occupation with a capital O, person with a capital P, or fictional character with a capital F. Many times if you know you have a compound class name then what people often do to better to enhance readability is to use this camel case uh, description that uh, each component you start then with a capital letter like in fictional character. And then for properties, properties usually are given in lowercase singular names like for example profession, birthplace, birth date. And you see here again for birthplace and birth date again camel case is used. So classes uppercase, properties lowercase because then everything is much easier than to determine if you read longer RDF descriptions. Okay, so far so good. Now we have everything together that we can then in the next lecture talk about more complex RDF data structures.